Hey everybody, it's Tom, WA2IVD. A while back, I showed you an accessory interface project that I was working on for ICOM radios. That project has been through several iterations now, and I've been planning on doing an update and making this available as a kit. And as I was planning it, I realized I've never really talked about all the accessory jack signals and what they do. So before I do that update, Let's take a look at those signals and how you might use them on ICOM and even other radios. Most major radio brands have one or more standard connectors for adding external accessories to their radios. ICOM is no exception to this. After some research, I believe ICOM settled on its current connector standard starting with the IC761 back in 1987. ICOM uses 7 and 8 pin DIN connectors. The 7-pin connector is intended for amplifiers or automatic band-based antenna switches. The 8-pin connector is for digital mode interfaces or other accessories that need transmit and receive audio. Starting with the IC706 in 1995, they added a single 13-pin DIN connector for smaller radios that don't have a lot of room on the rear panel. The single 13-pin connector carries the same signals that are included in the 7 and 8-pin connectors. This is possible because several signals are duplicated between the 7 and 8-pin connectors. ICOM offers a Y cable that plugs into radios with a 13-pin connector and splits out to female 7 and 8-pin connectors. So if you have an ICOM or other compatible accessory that uses a 7 or 8-pin DIN cable, you can connect it to a radio that only has a 13-pin accessory connector. As far as I have been able to determine, the definition and specifications of each signal has not changed from 1987 up to the most recent modern rigs. Not all radios support all signals, but for any signal that a radio does support, the specs are always the same and the signal is always on the same pin. The beauty of this is that if you have an ICOM or ICOM compatible amplifier, for example, that worked with an IC761 back in 1987, then it should work fine with your current modern ICOM radio. Although these connectors are unique to ICOM, most of these signals are very similar across all radio brands. Let's look at each signal. I'm going to go through these in functional order, and I'll be using my accessory interface to help demonstrate some of them. Let's get started. Pin 8, 13.8 volts. We're going to take a look at the 13.8 volt output. I have a little phono cable plugged into the 13.8 volt jack on the interface. And I've just got that connected to the positive and negative leads on the multimeter. We're reading 0, 0.00 volts because the radio is currently off. The 13.8 volt output from the accessory jack only supplies voltage when the radio is on. So if I turn the radio on, now we've got 13.8 volts as the radio comes up. Let's turn the volume down on that. And then if I turn the radio off, of course, the voltage goes back down to zero volts. What's the value of having this 13.8 volts? Well, you can use this if you want to have some other accessory equipment that you want to have powered up only when your radio is powered up. So one thing that you could do would be to connect this to a relay that maybe powers an outlet strip, perhaps a 120 volt outlet strip, so that when you turn the radio on, if you have a linear amplifier, maybe antenna rotator and some other equipment, you want that to all turn on automatically when the radio comes on and then turn off when you turn the radio off. You could also use a relay connected to a 12 volt power strip for a bunch of 12 volt accessories, maybe a power meter, again, an antenna controller if it's 12 volts or whatever. I was going to say a tuner, but if you're going to use a tuner, you probably want to use the tuner connector on the back of the radio, which is specifically for that, and use a tuner that's compatible with ICOM gear, and there's a number of those out there. So that's the 13.8 volts. Very simple, just provides power. 
why would you use a relay if you're only powering 12 volt equipment? And the reason for that is in case you need more than one amp worth of power, in the ICOM manual it tells you that the 13.8 volt output is rated for about one amp and anything more than that you're going to want to use a relay to control larger power. Now if you're just controlling maybe a watt meter and it's just driving the indicator light on the panel or something like that that's very low power you could use this to just power it directly if that's the only thing you're going to power with it. And that's all there really is for the 13.8 volts. Pin 1 8 volt regulated output. The other voltage output on the accessory connector is the 8 volt output. Now I've got my phono plug connected to the 8 volt output and still to the meter and again with the radio off we have 0 volts. So if we turn the radio on we see 7.92 volts. Whoop, let's turn that volume down again. And with that voltage, there's not too much you can do. In the manual, it tells you that that is only good for about 10 milliamps. So it's really just a reference source. And primarily, I believe it's supposed to be used as the reference source for the band output, which we'll be looking at in just a minute. And other than that, the only thing that I can imagine you would use that for is maybe the bias for an electret microphone if you wanted to have some sort of an external microphone somewhere you could potentially use this 8 volts for that but I don't really think that's too likely it's primarily set up as a reference for the band output and again we'll talk about how the band output works in a little bit pin 2 ground I don't have a separate video segment for this one I think it's pretty self-explanatory all of the other signals are referenced to this pin and this is the radio ground Pin 3, send or H send, depending on the radio model. We're going to cover this one together with pin 7, V send. This is because these two signals both function the same way. Only radios that cover HF, VHF, and UHF will have the V send signal. Next, we're going to look at H send and V send. These signals are going to be different depending on which model radio you have. On the 7100, we have both signals, H send and V send. On an HF only radio or HF and 6 meters, such as the 7300, there is only one signal. It's called send, and it's on the pin that H send is on. Radios that have HF and VHF UHF, the 7100, the 7000, I believe the 9100, and several other models. I, I can't remember all of them. But any radios that have HF and VHF, UHF will have both of these. They function pretty much identically, but for different bands. So let's just quickly take a look at how they work. These are also both inputs and outputs. So what do I mean by that? Well, right now you can see this is showing 6.7 volts. The radio is in receive. Let me, uh, let me actually go up to 10 meters here. We'll go someplace where I have a clear channel and nobody's around. Oh. And we'll turn the squelch up just so we're not listening to that. So. I have this connected to H send right now, which is HF, and we're on 10 meters. And if I key the mic, you'll see that that goes to zero volts when the radio goes into transmit. And that's really all it does, is this just grounds to let you know that the radio is transmitting. But I mentioned it is both an input and an output, and let me see if I can just do this here with the wires without messing up too much stuff. So, oh, let me get this flipped over here. So I just have this broken into a couple of wires, hopefully you can see those okay on camera. And if I touch these two together, because the, the bare wire is ground, and then the red wire is coming out of the H send line. If I touch these together, it keys the radio. 
and of course it goes to ground because I'm actually shorting the pin to ground. So this signal is both an input and an output. If you just monitor it, it tells you if the radio is transmitting, and if you externally ground it, it will put the radio into transmit. So what can you use this signal for? A couple of simple things you could use it for is a foot switch. If you wanted to have a foot switch for transmit and maybe you had a desk mic instead of the hand mic and you don't want to use the push button on the desk mic, you could just connect a foot switch to this that just shorts across the two pins on this connector and that'll put the radio in transmit when you step on the switch. So that's one simple reason. The other thing that you might want to use this for as an output from the radio is to control an external amplifier. Now if you have an ICOM amplifier, the ICOM amplifiers, depending on the radio, can actually plug directly into the accessory jacks on the back of the radios with the appropriate cable. But if you are using a non-ICOM amplifier, or maybe you don't want to use that cable because you want to use some of these other pins for something, you can just use the H send or the V send to key the amplifier. And when we talk about an amplifier, that answers the question of why there's two separate pins here, H send and V send. So on the 7100, we've got 160 meters through 440. So let's say you have an external HF amplifier. 160 through 10 or whatever the bands that you're going to use it for the H send line is what's going to go low when you are on HF and you can change the behavior of this a little bit in the set menus I'm not going to get into those details here but the H send line goes low when you're on H out the V send line goes low if you're on 2 meters or 440 that's the default configuration for these so if you were using the radio on two meters, for example, you would not want it keying up your HF amplifier. And actually, let's demonstrate that. Let me put the radio up here. And we're on 147.48. And actually, I've got a dummy load on the VHF UHF antenna. Um, although to be extra safe, let me just turn the power down here. So if I key the radio on two meters, let me turn the light on so you can see this, you notice this is not grounding the h send line. We'll look at the v send line in just a second. But that's not keying the radio. And again, if I go back and I do my other little trick that I did earlier, if I ground this, and you see the meter went to zero volts, the radio is not keying because I'm on two meters now and I'm grounding the H send line. So this will not key the radio on two meters, which if you're going to use this for a foot switch, you want to be aware of that. If you wanted to use the foot switch also for two meters, you'd need to hook it up to the V send line or change some settings in the menu. So that's the reason for two of these. And just to make sure, let's go to the V send, which is on the lower jack here on on my interface board, and if I key the radio now, you see this goes to zero, and if I short the two pins, it keys the radio. WA2 IVD testing. Oh, I just told you I'm hooked up to a dummy load. I didn't really need to do that because nobody's going to be hearing this. So. V-Send works on 2 meters and not on HF, and then just to, we'll go back to 20 meters here, and, and if I short this line, you can see the meter is going to zero, and it's not keying the radio. So that's H send and V send. And again, depending on which model radio you have, you may or may not have both of those signals. Pin 13, SQLS. Here we're looking at the 
SQL-S, or the squelch output. I'm not sure what the dash S is for, but that's the way they name it. So I've got my phone plug plugged into there. We're still using the multimeter. And we're connected up, and it says that when the squelch is closed, it'll be more than 6 volts, which it is. And it's like 100 microamps, so it's very little current. So you, if you're going to use this, you would use it with like a sense input, maybe on a microprocessor, something that's not really going to draw any amount of current to speak of. And then when the squelch opens, it gets pulled to ground. It says less than 0.3 volts in the manual, but it pulls, pulls it to ground. And if I close the squelch again, it goes back up. So again, that's all that's for. So you could use this externally if you wanted to, for example, maybe have a recorder turn on when the squelch opens. You could use this to automatically start a recorder going. Or if you wanted to have some other equipment start operating based on the squelch opening. I actually use the squelch on this board. I have a little circuit that mutes the audio going out. We'll talk about that when we get to the audio out. That applies to some radios. It doesn't apply to others. So again, squelch is pretty simple. It is either uh, above 6 volts or it's pulled to ground when the squelch is open. Pin 12, AF detector output. Next we're going to look at the AF slash IF output. So that's audio frequency or intermediate frequency output on the 7100. The 7300, most of the newer radios, this is listed as AF-IF because with a menu setting, you can change this to be an IF output. So it puts out a, I don't know how many kilohertz wide intermediate frequency signal. You can use that for radio mondial and some other digital radio modes that are out there on HF. It's not something I've played with, and those are broadcast. That's not on amateur frequencies. So that's part of what the IF output is for. If you have any older radios, this is only going to be audio frequency out. So I have a phono plug connected, and I have it connected to just a set of cheap computer speakers that are just off camera here. And I've got this tuned to WWV. That's through the radio speaker, just so we have something to hear. And if I turn the other speakers up, you can, you can hear it there. The value of this audio frequency output on the accessory jack is a couple of things. One, it's a line level output that's at a fixed volume level. So if I turn the speaker up here, and I don't know how well you can hear that. The volume that's coming out of this output is independent of the AF gain on the front of the radio. So whether you have this all the way up or all the way down, the level that's coming out of this jack stays the same. Now on the 7100, there is a menu setting under uh, if you go to the set mode under connectors, you can change this from 0 to 100% coming out of here. So you can adjust this, but again, it's independent of the AF gain or volume control knob on the radio. I think on some of the older radios, it's just fixed and you can't adjust this at all. I'm not sure which radios are which in that regard. So it's a fixed output. It's a line level output, so if you want to connect this to a set of external speakers or you might want to connect it, connect it to a mixer where you're going to hook it up to some larger external speakers or headphones or maybe combine audio from multiple different radios in your shack, that's really the value of this. Now, once upon a time, the other use for this audio output would be for doing digital modes so that you could connect this into an audio interface to your computer. With the 7100 and all of the modern radios that have a USB connection, you're most likely going to use that USB jack 
to do the audio because the radio's got a built-in sound card. If you have an older ICOM radio before they had the USB option, then you would still be using this, and then you would plug it into an audio interface of some type that you would connect to your computer. Now, one of the other quirks about this output, at least on the 7100, is that this output is not squelched, regardless of the squelch setting. So, for example, let me... I've got the radio speaker up here, and now I'm, this is the, let me turn this down. You're hearing the audio out of the AF out jack, and if I turn the squelch knob all the way up so that the receive light goes out, so I've got this all the way up, you're still hearing this. And just to show you the difference, if I turn up the volume here on the radio, if I turn the squelch all the way up, then it squelches the audio, and it obeys the squelch setting. This output on the 7100, at least, does not follow the squelch setting on the squelch knob. On this interface that I built up, whoa, sorry about that. On this interface, I built a little audio mute circuit that looks at that squelch pin that we looked at a few minutes ago. And if I change the jumper here so that it goes through the mute circuit, I have it so you can choose either way. So now, if I turn this up, we'll turn the radio down. Now we're listening to the audio out. And if I turn the squelch up, it goes off. So if you're using this for a computer interface where you're doing digital modes, you probably don't really care if it's squelched. And in fact, you may not want it to squelch ever. But if you're running this into a mixer where you want to just listen to the audio out of the radio, if, if you're listening to HF, you're probably not going to be using squelch that much. But if you're going to be monitoring a two meter repeater or something like that, you probably don't want to just listen to static all day long. Now this feature varies from radio to radio. On the 7300, for example, there's a menu setting to change whether this output is squelched or not. On the 706, which is an older ICOM radio, this output is squelched. It just behaves exactly the same way as the speaker output. It's always squelched, and there's actually no way to not squelch it. I believe the 7610, you have a menu option to either squelch it or not. And I believe as you go back to the older radios, this output is either squelched or not, depending on the radio model. And I'm, I'm not sure which ones are which way. You'd have to check in the manual. And actually, I'd, like in the 706 and in the 7100, it doesn't really say in the manual which way it is. So the other way is you just, by trial and error, would find out. So that's the audio output. Primarily, if you're going to hook up to a mixer or speakers or something like that, and on older ICOM radios that don't have a USB interface, you would use this to go to a sound interface for your computer for digital modes. Pin 11, mod. The next signal we're going to look at is mod in or modulation input. And I don't have anything plugged in right now to that because I don't really have a good way to demonstrate that. Modulation input is exactly what you might think it is to connect audio to go into the radio that would be feeding your transmit. So you would use this instead of the built-in mic or another mic plugged into the mic connector. There are a couple of different reasons you might want to use the modulation input. Just like the audio frequency out, if you had maybe a nice professional desk mic that you're using for your audio, for your transmit audio, for multiple radios, and you might have that mic connected into a mixer, you could put the mixer line output into this modulation input and use that for your rig audio. The other use would be for digital modes, just like we talked about with the AF output. And again, with modern radios, the 7100, the 7300, 7610, and so on, any radios that have a USB port, you're probably not going to use that for digital modes. 
older radios that don't have a USB port, this would be your connection to your sound card interface to your computer. Now, in the other thing about this input, with modern radios like the 7100 and so forth, there is a menu setting. It's in the set mode under connectors to choose which audio source the radio is going to use for transmit. You need to turn this audio source on if you want to use it. And again, on, on the 7100, 7300, 7610 at least, you can choose whether to use this for data mode or not data mode, normal mode, or both. And you can also choose to use the audio, the accessory input for audio by itself, or you can have it actually use the accessory and the mic input both, so it'll take from either one. Now, if you are going to use this on an older radio or even on a newer radio for a digital mode, you probably want to make sure you disable the microphone input because otherwise room noise in your ham shack is going to be picked up by the microphone and that's going to be blattering on into your audio for your digital mode and probably cause you problems. I believe on some of the older ICOM radios like the 706 and, and previous to that, I don't think there is an option to turn this input on or off. The radio is always taking from that or the microphone well it's taking from both of them simultaneously so if you were going to do digital modes i believe on the 706 you're going to want to disconnect your microphone from the radio while you're doing digital modes again so you don't get room noise messing up your transmit audio that's really it for modulation input pretty straightforward it's audio for transmitting pin 5 band this might be listed as no connection on some radio models, and on some radio models, there's a modification you have to perform internally to get this signal to function. Now we're going to take a look at the band signal. This is an output from the radio, and I talked about this a little when I was looking at the 8-volt output. I'm connected back up to my fluke meter for this with these, and I've also changed my connection I have the 7100 turned off, and I'm using the accessory jack on my 7300, which is off camera right now. And the reason for that is the band output on the 7100 requires that you go in and make a modification to the circuit board. You have to just solder in a little jumper on the 7100. That's explained in the manual. Otherwise, this output doesn't work on the 7100. I don't really know why that is, why they didn't just make it work by default from the factory, but you have to solder a jumper in the 7100. And I don't normally use this output, so I have not made that modification in the 7100. So we're going to look at it in the 7300. And the band output is pretty straightforward. It is just a voltage, and it's a different voltage between 0 and 8 volts, depending on the band that you're on. Right now, I'm on 20 meters. I'll try to show you a picture of that. And I'm going to switch bands here, and we can watch... Whoop, let me turn the light back on. We can watch what this does. First, we'll go to 160 meters. 160 meters is 7.46 volts. Next, I'm going to go to 80 meters. 6.11 volts. Next, I'm going to go to... 40 meters, 5.1 volts. Next, I'm going to go to 30 meters, 10 megahertz, 0 volts. And I don't know why they kind of carved that one out, because it's sort of not in line with the rest of them. But anyway, 30 meters is basically 0 volts. 20 meters, 4.09 volts, which was where we were when we started out, are pretty close to 4.1 volts. 17 meters, 18 megahertz, 3.2 volts. 15 meters, also 3.2 volts. So it doesn't change the output between 17 and 15. Maybe it considers the two of those close enough together that you don't need to switch amplifier antenna, and we'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, 12 meters. 24 megahertz, so 2.2 volts. 
and then finally 10 meters also 2.2 volts it doesn't change between 12 and 10 so 12 and 10 meters gives you the same voltage and 17 and 20 meters gives you the same voltage and then last I'm gonna go to 6 meters 50 megahertz and we are at 1.89 volts so that's what this output does is it gives you a different voltage for each band that the radio is on so you can look at that output and tell what band the radio is on so what do you use that for a couple of things again if you have an external high power amplifier most of the high power HF amplifiers there is a control switch on the front of it to set what band it's going to be operating on and many of those amplifiers have a remote control option most non-ICOM amplifiers will have an accessory cable or an accessory kit of some type to make it work with the band output on the ICOM radio. Other brands of radio, Yezu, Kenwood, have different ways of signaling bands. Yezu actually does it digitally. They have, on one of their accessory connectors, I think they have three or four pins that basically give you kind of a binary code where different pins go high and low to signify which bands it's on. The other place where you might use this is if you have multiple antennas. If you're fortunate enough to live someplace where you have lots of room for antennas and you have enough money to put up lots of antennas, you may have an automatic antenna switch that will switch to the antenna that's appropriate for whatever band you're on. So you may always want to use a particular vertical or beam or whatever on different bands. This can be connected to an automatic antenna switch so you don't have to manually change them. That's the band output. And again, that is the same, as far as I know, on all the way back to the oldest model ICOM radios that have the 13-pin or the 7- and 8-pin connectors, that band output works the same on all of those, as far as I know. Pin 6, ALC. The ALC signal... And again, I don't have anything to demonstrate this, so I don't have anything connected. ALC is automatic limiter control. This is the signal that's used if you are using an external like kilowatt amp or some, some level of high power amp, and you're connecting your radio to an amplifier. The ALC is an input to the radio. If the amplifier is starting to be overdriven, it sends actually a negative voltage. I believe it's like minus four volts to zero volts is the standard. And that's pretty standard across all radio brands. The amplifier will put a negative voltage on this pin to tell the radio to reduce the output power if it's being overdriven so that you don't cause splatter on the bands. So again, the use on the accessory connector, if you were using a non-ICOM amplifier, you would need to connect this pin to the ALC output on the amplifier. Pin 10, FSKK. This is the signal that's named differently between some different radio models. It may be called RTYK or RTTYK on some models. FSKK or FSK keying is an input to the radio. On some models of ICOM radios, this might be referred to as RIDI keying, or RTTYK. This is a keying input that causes the radio to shift its frequency when you're operating in radio teletype mode. This is probably not going to be used by very, very many of you these days, because most of the time, if you're going to operate RIDI, you're probably using one of the digital programs on a computer and it's actually sending audio tones into the radio to simulate this. This literally directly key changes the frequency that the radio is transmitting on by let's see either 170 hertz or whatever the shift is and that's programmable in the radio what the shift frequency or shift amount is. And you just ground this input for low and it has to be above 2.4 volts for high. So this would be pulled up by a resistor to maybe 5 volts or something. This would come out of a computer keying circuit that's actually just sending digital pulses instead of audio tones. 
The other place where this might be used is if you are into antique radio equipment and you have something like an old ASR-33. Go Google that if you want to know what it is, but that's uh, the old mechanical radio teletype machines. When they were sending, they just put out a, basically a switch closure that was open and closed. So you would use a relay or an opto-isolator or something from one of those older teletype units and connect it into this input to key the radio for radio teletype. So again, not, not much used these days, but it's still there if you want to use that equipment. The last two pins are 4 and 9. These are labeled BDT and T key. They're proprietary signals for the ICOM AT180 tuner. On a lot of different radio models, these are just listed as no connection or not used. There are no corresponding pins for these on the 7 and 8 pin connectors. So I don't have any video segments on these. They're proprietary to ICOM and they're not standard signals that you would use for anything else. Well, that's the scoop on all the accessory connector signals. If you're planning on any custom projects or adding external equipment to your radio, I hope you found this helpful. As for the interface board, this is going to be available as a kit in my online store very shortly, and I'll be posting an update video about that very soon. As always, thanks for watching. I'm Tom, WA2IVD, and this is Ham Radio A to Z.